and other devoted Vaishnavas to establish Shishi Gornitai, Shishi Radha Ras Bihari, Shri Sitaram Lakshman Hanuman in their home here at Radha Ras Bihari Temple in Bombay. Actually, just a few minutes ago, I was informed, along with all of you, that I had decided on the topic of tonight. <laughs> I didn't even know what it was till you told me that I decided. Uh, welcoming Lord Ram into our hearts. And that is the very spirit of bhakti. Because the supreme absolute truth, the personality of Godhead, is in every heart. Ishwara Sarva Bhutanam Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, I am in the heart of every living being. Mamaivam so jiva loke jiva bhutasana. That every living being is part and parcel of me. And I believe today India is celebrating the inauguration of the Constitution. Is that the holiday? Yes, Mother. Very emphatic affirmation. <laughs> well, on this constitutional day, we could remember Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu established the constitutional position of every living being. Jivera Swarupoy Krishna Nitya Das that we're all e eternal spirit souls, part and parcel, eternal servants of Krishna. And disconnected from that constitutional position, we perform so many unconstitutional activities and become entangled in endless complexities of karma or the laws of action and reaction. Our true potential and our constitutional happiness is in feeling Krishna's love and in reciprocating by offering our love to Krishna. That, in essence, is what we mean by seva, our service, devotional service. Sometimes in a very loose way, people define seva as to serve. But in the bhakti tradition, the real principle of seva is to reciprocate with Krishna's infinite love through our love. Yat karoshi rashnasi. All that we do, all that we eat, all that we offer and give away, is an offering of devotion. Patram pushpam palam toyam yome bhakta prayajjati. Even if we offer Krishna a leaf, a flower, a fruit, or some water, if it was done with devotion, Krishna accepts it. Atapum birdvijastreshtas varna shrama vibhagasha. 
Whatever our position, designation, or status in this world, our success is a singular truth. How we please God. If Krishna's please, whatever the world may think, however the world may interpret whether we're a success or failure, that is the ultimate success. And if Krishna's not pleased, we have failed. And what pleases Krishna? When whatever we do, whatever we speak, as far as possible, how we think, is based on the intention of serving the Lord with love. Srila Prabhupada cites the example of when you take water from the river Ganga. In your two palms, and with a sincere, heartfelt prayer, offer that water to Mother Ganga. Mother Ganga considers that handful of water to be more than all of the water she's, she's holding, if it's offered with love. Does she need the water? No. We're taking it from her. But yes, she does. In the sense that it's that love that gives satisfaction. And similarly, Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, I am the intelligence of the intelligence. I'm the strength of the strong. I'm everybody's abilities. I'm the light of the sun and the moon. What do we have to offer God? Sarvaloka Maheshwara. Krishna is the proprietor of everything that exists. But if we simply offer what Krishna is giving us with sincere devotion, whoever we may be, that is the success of our life. That is the path of perfection. And that is our constitutional nature. Disconnected from this truth, we become so distracted by illusory, apparent promises of happiness. Maya or the illusory energy. She's creating such a um, scenario of false hopes that in the pursuit of happiness, we implicate ourself, our loved ones, and so many others in imminent suffering. The Supreme Absolute Truth descends in various incarnations to teach us and to attract us. The Supreme Lord appears in the Treta Yuga as Lord Sri Ramchandra. In the teachings of Ramayana, we find how Lord Ram
Rosita. They play the roles like human beings to teach us the proper values, character, and to teach us how to achieve the real goal of life. It begins in Ayodhya. The kingdom of Maharaj Dasarath. Maharaja Dasarath. According to Shukadev Goswami in Srimad Bhagavatam, there is dynasties of great kings, emperors of the world. One was Katvanga. We all know his story. He kind of set the stage. He was such a powerful hero. <laughs> On behalf of the Devatas, he conquered a great onslaught of demoniac armies kiya aur uska pratikar kiya aisa karte hue karte samay anek varsho beet gaye yug beet gaye aur unko vardan diya gaya jo bhi vardan chahiye mang lijiye aap jab yuddh hua tha for all sorts of heavenly opulence to sabhi prakar ka swargiya aishwarya mang asked for so many things he said, just tell me when I'm going to die. He said, I'm going to die when I'm going to die. Tell me when I'm going to die. Because he is the one who 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 is the one. एक Was मिनट के तो निराश हो गए बहुत ही निराश हुए। उन्होंने कहा, ये क्या हुआ? मैंने कहा, He simply offered his body, mind, words, and life to the Supreme Lord, and in that one moment, he attained the supreme perfection. Tate nukam pamsu samikshaman. Lord Brahma tells, even in the most difficult situation, if we can gratefully remember the Lord. That, that is the qualification for supreme liberation. So Maharaj Katvanga, his grandchild was Raghu, great king. And the grandson of Raghu was Dasarat of the Raghu dynasty. Dasarat Maharaj, as was the custom in those early days, he had three queens, Kosalya, Kaikeyi, and Sumitra. But he didn't have a son, and he felt this great obligation. He was like the father for all of the citizens. And he was starting to get old and he needed to retire. And according to the tradition, he was meant to coronate his child to be the next king. But he didn't have 
He performed years of tapasyas and sacrifices and received blessings of great sages. And it was there in Ayodhya. It's a beautiful story. Valmiki Muni tells it. It's many chapters. But with the blessings of great sages like Vashishta, he performed a beautiful ceremony of devotion and prayer and mantras. And the Supreme Lord, a divine person on behalf of the Supreme Lord descended. And gave a pot of paramana, a pot of nectar. And he divided it among his queens, and soon four children were born, Ram, Bharat, Lakshman, and Satrugna. All four expansions of Lord Vishnu, who are eternally existing in the spiritual world. The eldest, the son of Kosalya, was Ram. And Srila Prabhupada explains, just as Krishna, as Gopal, he was so beautiful, so all attractive. He attracted the hearts and the surrender of love of all the Brijabhasis of Gokul. And in similar way, Lord Ram completely attracted the love and the surrender of all the residents of Ayodhya. They just couldn't think of anything except pleasing Lord Ram. And even when he was a little child, He was so obedient, even in his playfulness. He was so respectful to all. He was so kind that the citizens just couldn't wait till he becomes their king. Can you even imagine that idea? A little baby's crawling around and even Grandparents, what to speak of parents, business people, soldiers, pundits, great scholars. They're seeing a little baby and they're, they're feeling such attraction, such total faith in the love of this child and the compassion of this child. They can't wait till he's our king and we could follow him. That is Ram. That is Ayodhya. And his three brothers, all they wanted to do was assist him, serve him, and make him happy. Such a joy this was. As he grew, actually, Valmiki's Ramayan is 24,000 verses. So uh, I'm going to try to summarize. <laughs> when he was in his teens, the great sage Vishwamitra Muni, he's coming from, in from the forest. And our acharyas they much, very much emphasize this incident. Vishwamitra Muni was just wearing tree bark. He had no possessions. He was living in a, in a jungle with other ascetics, sadhus. And when he comes to the kingdom of Ayodhya, Emperor Dasarat bows to the feet 
of Vishwamitra Muni, washes his feet, sits Vishwamitra on the royal throne, and sits to ask how I can serve you. After some conversation, Vishwamitra Muni, he requested, there are terrible rakshashas, demoniac forces, who are harassing my ashram. Please, let me take Ram to deal with them. Now, Dasarat, he's seeing Ram not as the Supreme Lord. He's seeing Ram as his own child. He's not even yet fully trained to be the king. What to speak, great warrior. When Dasarat found out who these Rakshashas were, associates of Ravana, first he said, let's just keep Ram at my home and I will go personally with my entire armies. Vishwamitra Muni said, you'll lose, you can't win. Only Ram could win. Such a sacrifice, such faith in the words of a great saint. This is a real example. A man of such stature being the emperor. Yet still, he humbled himself with faith. And we read in Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat that when that sadhu came to Ekachakra and Hadai Pandit, who was a great Brahmin, he welcomed him and they spoke about Krishna all night long. And Hadai Pandit said, how can I serve you? He said, give me Nityananda Prabhu to go on pilgrimage with me. Nityananda Prabhu is very small. How can I live without him? This is impossible. But then he was thinking, Dasarat Maharaj was willing to give Lord Ram when he was still a boy to Vishwamitra Muni. That was the honor that a great ruler had for those who were enlightened beings. Vishwamitra Muni, at that stage of his life, he didn't try to be a Kshatriya. <laughs> he was living with the Dharma of a true sadhu. But Dasarat Maharaj had that faith. And such, such leadership that is, to have faith in the enlightened people who have no interest except the highest benefit for humanity in the loving service of the Lord. Lakshman insisted, I'm always at the side of Ram, let me come. They went into the forest, and sure enough, when um, <clears throat> they came to the ashram, these rakshashas, they created such a storm. They had horrible supernatural powers, and Ram, <laughs> he shot an arrow, boom. <laughs> and I think it was Subahu, he flew 800 miles and landed in the ocean. Oh, it was Maricha, was it? Yeah, Maricha and Subal. He, One was killed and one was tossed into the ocean. And from that point on, he was practically living in fear of Ram. And then they continued on in Ram Chandra as the Supreme Lord who's playing the role of an example 
of the character of a, of a human who's seeking the highest truth. He was humbly serving his guru. He was massaging the legs and the feet of Vishwamitra in the evenings. When it was cold in the jungle, he would go out and collect wood and start a fire to keep his guru warm. And he was inquiring about so many different subjects to learn from his guru. Tadvidi pranipatena pariprashnena sevi. To surrender, to take shelter, to inquire submissively, and to render loving service. And Vishwamitra Muni brought them to Mithala. And there, the famous bow of Shiva. Great warriors, devatas, all sorts of most powerful beings of the universe were coming there because if you could lift and string that bow, you could win Sita as your wife. According to the legend, when Sita, who was actually born from Mother Earth, Maharaj Janak performed years of austerities. And the eternal consort of Lord Ram appeared from under a plow in the earth as the most beautiful little baby girl. And one day when she was just cleaning, just dusting the palace, Janak Maharaj was watching her. With tears in his eyes, she was just so beautiful. He loved her so much. He was hiding behind her, just watching her cleaning. And she was so enthusiastic. And she was cleaning the altar where the bow was. Three hundred of the most powerful warriors could not even separate the bow by lifting it from the altar. She's dusting around it. And then she effortlessly, with one hand, she lifts it up, dusts under it, and puts it down. <laughs> Janak Maharaj was astounded. And somehow or other, in his astonishment, he made a pledge. It will take someone who lifts that bow and strings it to marry Sita. But nobody could do that. When Ram came to Mithila with Lakshman and Vishwamitra Muni, Sita saw him and fell in love with him. Ram saw Sita and fell in love with her. Janak, there's nobody else in all of Brahma's creation that I want to marry Sita than Ram. Everything was like that. So there was a big ceremony where they brought Ram before the bow. Lord Ram, he sees this enormous, incredible bow. <laughs> Sita's looking down, La Ram is so young and so, so beautiful. beautiful. How could he possibly lift a bow that even the most mighty supernatural warriors cannot? It was a very tense situation. Ram asked permission from Vishwamitra Muni, his guru. Can I see the bow? Vishwamitra Muni gives him blessings. Yes, here is the bow. Everybody's watching. 
total silence. It was a breathtaking moment. Ram inquires from Vishwamitra Muni, May I touch the bow? Vishwamitra Muni says, Yes. I give my blessings. Now Ram's touching the bow. Ram asks Vishwamitra Muni, Do I have your permission to lift the bow? Vishwamuni says, Yes, I bless you. He lifts the bow over his head. He strings it. He pulls the string. He breaks the bow in three pieces. And if you go to Mithila, Janakpur, still those places where the bow landed after being broken are there. Very holy place. And Sita comes down with the garland of victory. And then was a beautiful marriage ceremony in Mithila. Do you see the golden moon there? It's very, it's very beautiful. When they returned to Ayodhya, Kaikei, who was one of the queens of Dasarat Maharaj, she loved Ram so dearly. Dasarat Maharaj built for her a beautiful golden palace, most beautiful site in Ayodhya. And Kaikei, she was so happy when Ram came home with Sita that she gave as a gift to Sita her golden palace. How many of you here have gone to Ayodhya in your lifetime? Well, I was just there a few days ago, and I went to that palace. It's called the Kanak Bhavan or Kanak Mandir. In fact, Madhavananda Prabhu and Govinda Prabhu brought me there. And even today, it's considered, up until the Janmabhumi Ram Mandir, Ram Lao, that that was, the, it's, it's actually the most prominent temple in Ayodhya. It was given with such love and respect by Kai K to Sitan Ram. Later, when the word came out that Dasarat was going to perform the coronation ceremony for Ram to be the prince regent, that means the soon coming king. It was the prayer that everyone on Ayodhya was crying for from the time he was born. Can you imagine the celebration? He's going to now be our next king. There was so much celebration, so much joy, so much anticipation and expectation. And somehow or other, Mantra, who was an assistant of Kaikei, convinced her to be fearful, insecure, that if Ram is king, he knows your son Bharata has such good qualities. He's going to banish him to stay in power. Kaikei said, no, I love Ram just like I love Bharata. How could that be? 
But somehow or other in that association, she became insecure. She became fearful. She became suspicious that something might happen if Ram becomes king that will be contrary to the well-being of myself and my son. How this mantra could change Kaikei in such a way is one of the great lessons of the Ramayana. Srimad Bhagavatam tells, Mahatsevam dwaram ahuravam uktes tamo dwaram yoshita sangi sangha. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu cites this verse. By associating with great souls, the doors to liberation. And by associating with those who are influenced by the lower modes of nature, the doors to ignorance and bondage. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, a satsanga tyaga. By associating with the devotees of the Lord, the doors to love of Krishna are open. And to, to associate with those who are overcome by lust and envy and anger and greed and all of these things, we become influenced. I K, knowing that Dasarat Maharaj was obligated to her. She convinced Dasarat Maharaj, make my son Bharat king. Dasarat Maharaj was heartbroken. But he said, I, you know, I could do that. But then she asked for a second benediction that he owed her due to some past um, obligation. She said, exile Ram to the forest for 14 years. Because of insecurity, because of fear, it quickly manifested as envy. That next morning, Ram came. He went to his mother, Kosavya, and got her blessings. He went to his father, and Dasarat is laying down completely devastated. He can't even speak. He says, this is a day of celebration, Father. Why are you like this? He just, he was groaning, and Kaikei said, your father can't speak because he has just solemnly promised me to fulfill my wish. You will be banished for 14 years, and my son Paratu will be the prince regent. Dasarat, all he could do was cry. As soon as Ram heard that, he said, My father, if this is your promise to preserve your honor, yes, I will go today. He had no hesitation. Srila Prabhupada remarks in this way, Ram immediately accepted it. He went back to his mother, Kosalya, who was, who was, she stayed up all night doing all sorts of beautiful devotional rituals for the well-being of her son. And now it's just about the time for the procession. And he, and he comes. And she says, why are you dressed like this? It's time for the coronation. And he explained to her what happened.
This is such an intimate moment in Vedic history. Koshalya is trying to convince Ram, you don't, don't go. Dasarat's in Maya. Why should you go? But when she saw that Ram was determined to go, She spoke with such appreciation and gave good instructions of how to live on the path of nobility, virtue, and, and dharma. When Ram saw that Sita was going, I mean, when Sita saw that Ram was going, she said, I, immediately, I'm coming with you. Ram said, you cannot come with me. You're a princess. You've lived in the highest luxury, surrounded by, by protection and, and affection. I'm going to live in the wilderness with snakes and tigers, and rain, and cold, and heat, and sleeping on the hard ground, and having no house. You cannot come. But from her heart of heart, if I'm with you, Ram, then the forest will be Ayodhya. But without you, the Ayodhya will become a brutal forest. I've given my word. My father has given my word. I will be with you unconditionally. The sacrifice of her love, when Ram saw from the core of her heart she wanted to go, he said, yes, let us go. And of course, Lakshman could not be persuaded not to go. And before departing, Kaikei insisted, you have to live in the forest as renunciates. And she arranged that they take off all their clothes and just put on tree bark. Ram immediately did it, no problem. Lakshman did it with no problem. But then they gave Sita tree bark clothes, and she looked at it. She didn't know how to put it on. She just had tears in her eyes, and Kaikei put it on for her. And at that point, Das, even Vashishta Muni, the great guru of the kingdom, they just broke down crying. How could see to go to the forest like this? And when Ram left with Sita and Lakshman, practically the entire Ayodhya went with him. Sumantra, the charioteer of Ram, of Dasarat Maharaj, brought them into the forest. And this was the beginning of their exile. The whole of Ayodhya, their only hope, their only happiness was spending the 14 years in the forest with Ram. And there was even very old Brahmins who were struggling like anything to keep up with the chariot of Sumantra. And at a certain place, Ram instructed everyone to honor my father, I must go alone with Sita and Lakshmi. You must return. But they couldn't return. But yet, it was his order. 
And when everyone was really, really tired and Ram and Lakshman and Sita rested, while everybody was resting, Ram, they got on the chariot and ordered Suman to take us. And they all returned back to Ayodhya. In this intense experience of love and separation, Sumantra came to the bank of the Ganga. And there was a wonderful tree. Ram said, let us spend the night here. And it was there that a Nishada king, a tribal king from the jungle, his name, Maharaj Kuha. He was a great devotee of Ram. He had an entire army. He had an entire little kingdom of, of, of people living in the forest with him. They lived very basic, simple lives. He didn't really have any social status within the ordinary society. But he had so much love. When he found out what had happened to Ram, he said, for the next 14 years, I offer you my entire kingdom. You're meant to be in the forest. This is the forest. We will give you, we will build you a beautiful house here. We will get you the finest foods here. We have whole armies to protect you. You'll be filled and surrounded by loving devotees. He brought Ram the best of foods that could be offered. Ram accepted it and then gave it all back to him. He said, I'm, I have come to the forest to be an ascetic. He said, but the horses of the chariot are my father's horses. Out of honor and respect for them, you should feed them to their full satisfaction. And then Lakshman brought Ram and Sita a little water, and that's all Ram would accept. Guha Maharaj offered his entire kingdom to Ram. He was the king. Let me just be the servant of the servant of your servants. That's all I want, my prayer. And he meant it. Ram said, I'm leaving tomorrow alone with Sita and Lakshman. I cannot remain here. But I accept your love and devotion. They arranged a nice bed for Ram. Ram said, no, no, I will sleep on the ground under the tree. They just put some grass on the ground and, Ram, and Sita and Ram peacefully went to sleep laying in the ground of the cold forest. Guha Maharaj offered Lakshman, at least you take the bed and sleep. Lakshman, he said, I will stand guard for Ram. Guha Maharaj said, I have an entire army here. You know me. I have complete love, devotion, unconditional. I will protect Ram and Sita for the night. You take rest. Lakshman replied, Ram and Sita, they are meant to be the king and queen, living in the most beautiful palace, surrounded by loving citizens. How can I tolerate seeing them 
sleeping on the hard ground of a forest. No, I cannot sleep. I cannot sleep. I cannot rest seeing them in this condition. So the whole night long, Lakshman and Guha simply did Ramkata, talking about the glories of Ram. In such an intense state of the crisis of their loving concern. The next morning, Guha Maharaj arranged a boat for Ram, Lakshman, and Sita to cross Mother Ganga. And it was there that Ram told Sumantra, you must go back to Ayodhya. Sumantra said, no. How could you do this? The citizens of Ayodhya are on the verge of death by seeing you leave Ayodhya on your father's chariot. If I return with the chariot and you're not on it, how will any of them live? Therefore, I will join you for the next 14 years and live in the forest as an ascetic with you. To preserve the dignity of his father's instruction to him, Lord Ram said, no, no, you must go back. And then as they were crossing Mother Ganga, Sita offered a beautiful prayer. O oh, Mother Ganga, O oh, River Ganges, we are crossing you now. And may Lord Ram be happy for the next 14 years until we can return to this place to cross over and return to our home in Ayodhya. From there they went to Prayag, walking by foot. Now, this was a momentous occasion. After they crossed Mother Ganga, they were in a serious wilderness of a forest. There was no chariot. There was no Sumantra. There was no Maharaj Guha and his, and his kingdom of great devotees. It was just the three of them in the dense, wild forest. They traveled to Prayag, where they met Bharadvaj Muni. And knowing what had happened, he invited them, you stay here for 14 years. I have so many wonderful disciples, and we will just surround you. And Bharadvaj Muni had such supernatural yogic mystic powers, he could manifest anything. But he was living as an ascetic. So you live with us. But Ram, in order to not disturb the residents of Ayodhya, because he knew if they knew where he was, how could they contain their enthusiasm from coming to meet him? He said, please show, show us a place where we could live in a beautiful natural environment that is so secluded that only great sages and rishis and yogis will be living there, and nobody else will know where we are. He said, I know the perfect place. Just 60 kilometers from here, there is a beautiful mountain. 
surrounded by a wonderful forest with the most auspicious flower-bearing, fruit-bearing trees and flocks of auspicious birds singing and, and honeybees buzzing, peacocks cawing, The Mandakini Ganga is flowing beside this mountain. And it is a favorite place for the most pure-hearted loving sages who are there worshiping the Lord. It is the mountain and forest of Chitrakut. That is the perfect place. The next morning, after spending the night in the ashram, Sita Ram and Lakshman traveled to Chitrakut. Such a lovely place. They were greeted by such pure hearted sadhus. Lakshman built a nice little hut for Ram and Sita to live in with wood and straw. It was such a beautiful pace. Even though Sita was so broken hearted to see Ram living as an ascetic. And actually, when they were with Maharaj Guha, Ram ordered Maharaj Guha to get the sap of banyan trees to make he and Lakshman's hair matted. So they're living in tree bark, clothes in a little straw hut with matted hair. And yet, in the atmosphere of Chitrakut, there was nothing but happiness. Just being among such pure hearted, great souls. Meanwhile, while they were gone, when Sumantha returned to Ayodhya and he described the message of Ram and he described the condition of Sita, just in a bewildered state with tears in her eyes, living as an ascetic in the forest, it was so heartbreaking that Dasarat Maharaj could not live. He left the world chanting the name of Ram. And according to Ramayan, when the emperor died, it describes Mother Earth became a widow. That's the way the people experienced the death of Dasarat. Vashishta Muni called Bharat, who was visiting a relative in a distant place with Sadrugna. They didn't say what happened, but they said, there's a crisis, you must come back immediately. And when Bharat entered into Ayodhya, he saw so much lamentation. So much darkness. Nobody could speak a word. He was bewildered. What has happened? He went to his father's palace and his father was not there. His mother, Kaikei, she was nicely ornamented. And she explained everything that happened, thinking that he would be very, very happy. Now he's going to be the emperor. And he has no competition, because Ram is exiled. When Bharat heard this, his heart was broken. He was so, so angry upon his mother. He totally rejected her. 
And he decided right then and there, immediately, I will go to the forest. I will find Ram. I will convince him to come back and be the king. Now Dasarat Maharaj is gone. Our father. And I will fulfill the promise and stay in the forest as an ascetic for 14 years. How his heart was breaking to think of Sita living in this way. When his mother saw his determination, she realized that she was in a total state of illusion. She lived in total regret. What did I do? Meanwhile, Bharat comes back. He goes to the residence of Kosalia, Ram's mother. She says, oh, Bharat, I congratulate you. Your plan is a success. Now you can be king. Your father, my husband, Dasrat, is dead because he could not bear the separation of Ram. And my only son and my beloved daughter, Sita. How could you be happy knowing they're living as an ascetics exiled in the forest? Bharat broke down crying. Mother Kosalia, I had nothing to do with this. I will not allow this to happen. I give you my word, I will go to the forest and I will take that exile and bring back Ram. Kosalia, I'm sorry that I misunderstood you. <laughs> and the plans were made. Not only was Bharat going to go to the forest, but Vashishta Muni, the guru, and all the sages, and all the rishis, and the three queens who were all widows now, they were all going to go. And the chief ministers, the armies, they were all going to Chitrakut to bring back Ram. And Bharat was going to remain behind. When they reached Chitrakut, you all know the story. There was a big commotion. There was thousands of elephants and tens and thousands of chariots. It was a huge procession. Ram asked Lakshman, climb the tree and see what's happening. So he climbed a tree and looked down and he saw this multitudes coming. And he saw elephants and he saw chariots and he saw Bharat's flag. And Lakshman was furious. Not only did Bharat plot to exile us into the forest along with his mother, but now that he has control of all the armies, so that you cannot come back after 14 years to take his position, he's come to kill you. Bharat was so angry. I mean, Lakshman. Lakshman is Balaram. His eyes were like red coals. He trembled with rage. And he proclaimed, on this very day, I will destroy the entire army of Ayodhya if they try to harm you, and I will end the life of Bharat. Ram heard this. He chastised Lakshman. He said, Bharat, 
loves me. He is devoted to me more than anyone, as much as you, Lakshmi. How dare you doubt his integrity of intention? He has come to convince me to return. Lakshman was very embarrassed. And then along with Vashisht and the sages, Bharat came, he ran forward to the Kamagiri, the Chitrakut mountain, to meet with Lord Ram. When he saw from a distance Lord Ramchandra, Sita, wearing tree bark with matted hair, living in a straw hut, his heart was breaking. In great anticipation of love, he ran up, and when Ram saw him, they ran together and embraced. And even today, if you go to that place at Ritakut, you will find in the rocks there are four footprints. The footprints of Ram and the footprints of Bharat facing one another when they embraced with brotherly love. It was so deep that literally the stones melted. And then Satrugna and Lakshman embraced, and their footprints are there. And when Kosalya came to that mountain and met with Sita, she embraced her. So there's three sets of footprints. in the Kamagiri mountain of Chitrakut. Bharat and all of Ayodhya were there with the singular intention to bring Ram home. Srila Prabhupada explains that this opulence of renunciation, the Supreme Personality of Bhagavan is one who possesses six opulence. Beauty, strength, knowledge, fame, wealth, and renunciation. To teach Dharma to the people of the world, the Supreme Personality of Godhead renounced everything. Bharat, the sages, the ministers, they were all giving scriptural arguments, social arguments, every type of argument to bring Ram back. When it all failed, Bharat brought a pair of wooden sandals, Baduka, and asked Ram to place his feet in them just one time. And he took those wooden shoes and brought them back to Ayodhya and put them on the throne. And according to Srimad Bhagavatam and Valmiki's Ramayana, Bharat would not live in Ayodhya. There's a forest, an isolated forest not far from Ayodhya named Nandigram. And in that forest, he slept on the ground. He only wore deerskin. He matted his hair. 
and he only ate raw roots and herbs. And Sukadev Goswami describes his only food was barley soaked in cow urine. In other words, he wanted to live in greater poverty and austerity than, than he saw Ram and Sita for 14 years. And Srila Prabhupada explains on a Ram Nomi in a lecture, what was Bharat's devotion? He kept Ram's shoes as the king. And would fan with chamaras those fruit shoes, and and the, the 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 shoes, the sandals were on the throne in the palace, while Ram lived, while Bharat lived in the jungle. He accepted none of the glory, or none of the luxuries of a king, but he perfect performed all the administration required of a king. So he did the work, but accepted none of the privileges for 14 years. That was Bharat. Meanwhile, after they returned to Ayodhya, Ram Sita and Lakshman decided we shouldn't stay in Chitrakut because now not everybody knows we're here. They entered the Dandakaranya forest. And eventually they were meeting so many great rishis and munis and taking blessings and getting benedictions that was the example of their character. And they made their residence in this great state of Maharashtra, in the place Panchavati. And there in Panchavati, on the bank of the Godavari River, Ram built a beautiful little hut for Sita. I mean, Lakshman built a hut for Sita Ram. And Lakshman would not sleep. He was simply there at every moment eager to serve Ram and Sita's desires. There's the wonderful story of Suparnaka, the sister of Ravana. She was roaming through that Dandakaranya forest. And when she saw Ram, she was an evil, exploitative, lusty, envious person. But she fell in love with Ram's external appearance of beauty. She wanted to enjoy Ram. Irresistible. So she, by her supernatural power, she transformed her monstrous form into a beautiful heavenly woman. She was most beautiful. And she approached Ram. To take him away with her. But when she saw that Ram would not leave Sita, she decided to kill and eat Sita. She attacked her. And Ram said to Lakshman, no, no, um, no need to continue joking with this lady. So, 
at Ram's instruction, Lakshman drew his sword, <laughs> cut off her nose. Um, Suparnika was, not only was she miserable, she was really humiliated. She went howling and she told her brothers, Kara and Dushan, and they attacked with 14,000 Rakshasha soldiers and Ravana defeated them and Suparnika ran. She, by her mystic power, she went back to Sri Lanka and told Ravana that I've never seen anything so beautiful as this girl named Sita. She's perfect for you. I was trying to bring her back for you to enjoy, but then Ram and Lakshman cut off my nose and my ears and all of these things. And how dare you allow this injustice? Do something about it. So it was there. Panchavati at that moment became known as Nasik. That Ravana had Maricha disguise himself as a golden deer to allure Rama away. And Ram wanting to, to bring this, Sita asked Ram, do you see this beautiful golden deer? Please let us bring him back to Ayodhya to be our pet. So Ram went out to catch the deer. And then the deer called out in the, in the voice of Ram, Lakshman, help me. And Sita said, go and help him. And Lakshman said, that's not Ram's voice. There's no danger of Ram. And Sita, um, she ordered Lakshman to go. And it was at that time that Ravana disguised himself as a great sage knowing that Sita will always offer service and respect to a sage. And it was there in Nasik that Ravana forcibly abducted Sita. He had a chariot drawn by monstrous, ghostly mules that was flying in the sky. And I'm going to end real soon. I think. And as they were flying over the sky, they passed a tree, and on that tree was Jatayu, very old vulture. He was a great devotee of Ram and a great friend of Dasaratma but he was very, very old. He was sleeping. And Sita saw him and cried from the sky, Jatayu, please, if you see Ram and Lakshman, tell him. Tell my beloved Ram that I've been kidnapped by Ravana and he's taking me away. Ask him to save me. Jatayu, just deliver this message. But please don't try to stop Ravana. Because he is, he is so powerful. He has such weapons. And you are just too old. When Jatayu heard this, he woke up and he looked up and he saw what was happening. He could not remain idle. He knew he couldn't win, but he couldn't live to, and see this injustice. He loudly chastised Ram. What type of coward are you? Why didn't you face Ram and fight him? Why you distracted him to go to a distant place? And when he's away, 
You kidnap his wife? Like a cowardly dog? That when the cook is away and nobody's in the kitchen, he goes into the kitchen to steal food? Jatayu proclaimed, whether I live or die, I'm not going to live and see you take Sito away. He jumped up and attacked Ravan. And what a fight. One of the greatest battles the world has ever seen. Jatayu is so old, but yet every bit of his strength Ravana could not believe what was happening. When he was, when this huge bird with his wings expanded came to attack Ravana, he had this mystic bow and arrow, and he was shooting hundreds and Thousands of razor sharp arrows into the body of Jatayu. And Ravana had 20 arms. It's described that Jatayu's entire body was pierced with these arrows. And with his wings, he just brushed, kept brushing them away, bleeding like anything. And he attacked Ravana. All he had was his claws and his beak. He broke Ravana's bow. So what did Ravana do? He picked up another bow and started shooting. Jatayu destroyed Ravana's chariot destroyed his charioteer, destroyed all of the mules pulling his chariot. He jumped on Ravana's back, and with his claws, he was ripping his back apart, and with his feet, he was pulling his, he was pounding his head, and Ravana was just holding on to Sita and fighting and fighting and fighting, shooting arrows and arrows. And this battle went on and on until Jatayu became just exhausted. Ravana put Sita on the ground, pulled out his razor sharp sword, and cut the wings and the legs of Jatayu who fell to the ground. Upon saying this, Sita ran to Jatayu's bloody body. He was now dying, totally defeated. And here is the supreme goddess of fortune, Sita Devi, with tears of love for this bird embracing him, thanking him. Because of me, Sita was saying, you are now suffering and about to die. How can I ever repay you? You have given up your life for me. May Ram bless you in every way. When you see Ram, Please tell him where I'm, what has happened. Sita gave her most heartfelt supreme blessings to Jatayu. Although his body was laying on the ground in a massive pool of blood, Still, Sita was embracing him 
the Supreme Mother. Ravana came back down. To capture Sita, she was holding on to a tree and he pulled her by the hair and by his own supernatural powers began to fly away with her. As Sita was looking down at her beloved devotee, Chitayu, Meanwhile, Ravana brought Sita all the way back to Sri Lanka, his kingdom. He offered her the most magnificent golden palaces, every type of luxury, jewels, promised her the entire Sri Lanka would be there to serve her and give her pleasure under his command. But Sita rejected. She told Ravana, you trying to enjoy me is like an ignorant fool who wants to enjoy licking honey from the sharp edge of a razor blade. Think about that. You're trying to enjoy putting pins in your eye. I have given my heart to Ram. Ravana was so um, so frustrated with the desire to enjoy. As his sister wanted to enjoy Ram, he wanted to enjoy Sita. Such a lesson, such a powerful person with so much wealth, he had so many queens, but like Hiranyakashipu, nothing could satisfy when we were attached to sense gratification and arrogance. Ravana ordered Sita, where he ordered um, Rakshashis. to convince Sita to accept his proposal. And every day he was coming. Meanwhile, when Ram found that Sita was gone, he and Lakshman were searching and searching and searching everywhere, weeping, crying, where is our Sita? They had no idea where she had gone or why. Although he's the knower of everything, still in his Leela, he accepts this role. And ultimately, they came upon Chitayu. When Ram saw this huge bird laying in a pool of blood, he said to Lakshman, this evil bird has eaten Sita. This is her blood all around. He drew his bow and arrow and ran to Jatayu to kill him. And Jatayu's laying. And he's crying out, Oh, Ram, I'm Jatayu. <laughs> I'm your devotee. I tried to save Sita, but I was unable to do it. When Ram recognized, he dropped his bow and he dropped his arrow. You have, you have risked your life. You have, 
You were willing to give up your life to protect my Sita? There is no one more dear to me than you. And it was at that time with Chitayu's information that Ram first learned that it was Ravana that kidnapped Sita and was headed in the southern direction. Ram put Chitayu's head in his lap. He was caressing his head with his hand like a father to a child. As Chitayu was giving him a report of Sita's condition, As Jatayu was looking at the beautiful moon-like face of Lord Ramchandra, chanting his holy names with blood flowing from his mouth, he left, he left this world. Seeing this, Ram began to cry. He told Lakshman, there is no one more dear to me in this world than Jatayu. At the loss of Jatayu, who gave his life for my Sita, I am feeling as much pain as the loss of my father and the abduction of Sita herself. Ram and Lakshman made a funeral pyre. And Ram personally performed the last rites for Jatayu. Then Ram went to the Godavari River and offered oblations with mantras for Jatayu. And Ram declared there in his prayer that Jatayu on this very day, I bless you with the supreme liberation of eternal residence in the spiritual world of Vaikuntha. Later on, Ram came to Kishkindakshetra made allies with Hanuman, Sugriva. They helped the Lord to discover where Sita was, and the great battle took place. And we know in the course of Sri Hanumanji's pastimes, she jumped over the ocean to find Sita. He gave her Ram's message, and Sita gave a mess secret message for Hanuman to bring back to Ram. At that time, Hanuman was so angry at Ravan, he wanted to meet him face to face. And here he is, tied up with ropes as a captive. All the great generals and military of the Rakshasha army are standing along with Ravana. And Hanuman, face to face, calls Ravana a coward. And tells him, if, if you just... Give Sita back to Ram. Ram will be your ally forever. If not, if you keep her, then Ram will come to destroy you and your entire dynasty. Ravana became so angry. He had the Rakshashas beat Hanuman, who was still tied up. 
and then light his tail on fire. And Hanumanji, he was so enthusiastic to serve his beloved Ram. And upon meeting Sita and seeing her condition, he was so upset that as they were marching him through the streets of Sri Lanka to humiliate him and burn him to death as you were beating his tail on fire, wrapped up with all sorts of um, cloths and soaked with oils. Anuman was seeing this as an opportunity to serve. He broke out of the ropes and jumped up on top of a palace and touched it with his tail, went on fire. He jumped to the next palace, touched his tail, another fire. He lit practically the entire kingdom on fire, jumping and jumping, and Ravana's nothing he could do about it. He was seeing everything burning and burning and burning. And when Sita was given the news of what was happening, in her love, she prayed to Agni, the god of the fire, that as Anuman's tail is blazing on fire, please let him feel no heat. Let it be very cooling and refreshing to him. And actually, even though his tail was blazing on fire, so much blazing was make, igniting everything on fire, Hanuman was feeling the fire in his tail to be very soothing and cool. And he immediately understood in his heart, this is the prayer and blessing of Mother Sita. Hanumanji then jumped up to a mountain in Lanka, and with a roaring voice, he called out Ravana, Give Sita back to Ram. I am just an insignificant servant of a servant of Ram, and you see what I've done? If you do not give back Sita, Ram himself will come to destroy you and everything dear to you. And then he jumped in the ocean, put his tail out of fire, jumped back to Kishkinda, went to the cave where Ram was waiting, and gave a whole report, and gave the message of Sita to Ram. And it was then and there that Lord Ram, in infinite gratitude to his devotee, he cried. He said, I'm living as an ascetic with nothing in the forest. What can I give you in return? All I have is myself. I give you my life. Ram then embraced Manuman. That embrace was the ultimate perfection of all Hanuman's aspirations to be accepted by Ram. That is the love of the Lord for the devotee and the love of the devotee for the Lord. From there, they went to the shore, that area near Ram Rameshwaram is Danus Tirtha. They had to cross the ocean, the Indian Ocean, and Ram wanted to, Ram sat for three days fasting to get Samudra, the, the, the presiding deity of the ocean, to give permission to cross. But Samudra did not pay any attention. 
Mad Bhagavatam tells Ram's glance became so angry that he's not helping to find Sita, that he gazed upon the ocean and the entire ocean, ocean started burning and all the fishes and everybody were trying to get out but they couldn't and then Sumudra came and surrendered to Ram and said, now I give you, you can build a bridge across the ocean. You could put mountain peaks and rocks and they will all float upon me. They built that bridge with a huge bridge. Hanuman, Sugriva, Nila, Mainda, Vivida. <laughs> um, the entire entourage of the Vanaras built this beautiful bridge across the ocean to Sri Lanka. And there was the great battle. Ibishan, Ravana's brother, he was such a great devotee. He, along with Mandodari, the principal wife, and so many, they were trying to convince Ravana, just give back Sita or everything will be lost. But his arrogance, his ego, he could not accept. Vibhishan joined Ram's army. And the great battle of Sri Lanka was fought. The, a beautiful lesson. Chatayu Anuman. They both gave everything they had to protect Sita. Hanuman was always victorious. Chatayu was defeated and killed. But they both attain the same glory. Success is to please the Lord. Jatayu lost, but he won. Ravana won, but he lost. Success, victory, glory. If it is not pleasing to the Supreme Lord, we lose. But even if all of our attempts are externally seen by the world as futile, failure, if it's done for the pleasure of the Lord, it is the supreme victory, the supreme success. Ravana and Ram, in the, at the end of this war, after his entire army was practically destroyed, Ravana and Ram face to face at a battle. And with an arrow, Ram pierced the heart of Ravana, and he fell to the ground, dead. It was then that Vibhishan gave a beautiful flower airplane to Ram. Ram coronated Vibhishan as king.
And I just listened to a tape of Srila Prabhupada. He describes Ram did not fight that war to conquer Sri Lanka. Because he won the war and then he gave it all to Vibhishan, Ravana's brother. He simply went there to punish the wicked Ravana for his offenses and to rescue Sita. They come, they boarded this beautiful airplane, the Pushpavan. As it was coming close to Ayodhya, near Chitrakut, Ram told Hanuman, go to Nandigram, where Bharat is living. He's my dear devotee. But even a dear devotee, even a greatest souls, he's been in this high position of ruling over Ayodhya for 14 years. And human nature is, when you have a high position and a role, it's almost impossible not to be a, come attached to that. If Bharat has the slightest bit of attachment for continuing on ruling over Ayodhya, And I want him to continue. Go there. Tell him I'm coming. And Hanuman, I know that you, there is no one who can understand human nature and human character as well as you. If you feel or see, even the slightest tinge of Bharat being attached or disappointed that I'm coming, then you come back and tell me, and I will not interfere. So Hanuman went ahead of the Pushpavan. And there in Nandigram, Bharat was living in his little straw hut, sleeping on the ground, eating cow urine and barley in a tree, <laughs> performing severe austerities. And Hanuman tells, Ram is coming. Fourteen-year exile is over today. He's returning. Bharat entered into a state of transcendental ecstasy of love. He couldn't contain his transcendental emotions. When Hanuman saw this, he, he was convinced. Bharata had not even the slightest tinge of anything. He was filled with happiness. Glorifying Ram, they were simply singing and dancing, chanting Ram's name together. As Bharata was asking, where is he? Where is he? When will he come? And when the Pushpavan was in the sky above, Hanuman said, there is Ram. And when Ram landed the airplane, he and Bharat embraced. Bharat brought Ram's padukas, his wooden sandals from the throne, and offered it back to Ram and arranged a wonderful procession 
And all the citizens of Ayodhya were there as Ram was on procession back into a, back to his palace after 14 years of separation. And in that procession, they lined the roads, everyone's homes in their hands. They were all offering beautiful lamps of love to welcome Ram back home. And that is the celebration of Diwali, the new year. So, as Mukunda Madhava Prabhu was telling us, on January 22nd, that's four days ago, Beautiful prana pratishna of installing Ram at the very place of his birth, Janmabhumi. After approximately 500 years of separation. Glorious day of celebration. To the Prabhupada, On behalf of all of our great Acharyas, have taught us that Krishna, Ram, is within our hearts. He writes, that Lord Ram, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada writes, Lord Ram has appeared in this age of Kali as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. To teach us Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtana, that the Lord has descended in his holy names. And by sincerely chanting the holy names of the Lord, that is the transcendental means by which we can invite and welcome Ram within our hearts. Kali Kale Namarupe Krishna Avatar. The purpose of our temples, whether it's in Ayodhya or here at Radharas Bihari Temple or all other temples, is to give us an atmosphere. The Lord is making himself present to give us an atmosphere in which we can devote our lives, surrender our hearts to serving Him. Tonight we are seeing so many thousands of people all around to celebrate this very, very auspicious event. We're hearing Ram's glories, Ram's pastimes, and the love 
of Ram for his devotees and devotees for Ram. And if we read His Holiness Giriraj Swami Maharaj's book, Let There Be a Temple, what is the name of the book? I'll build you a temple. I'm sorry. Yes. I'll build you a temple. It's in Srila Prabhupada's life, Giriraj Swami Maharaj personally sung that same devotion, that same surrender as Jatayu, as Hanuman, as Vibhishan, as Maharaj Guha, that same quality of love and devotion as the Gopas, the Gopis, for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. Why? Why did Srila Prabhupada struggle so much for this beautiful temple that we're now enjoying tonight and for all of his projects throughout the world? Just to inspire us to welcome Krishna back into our hearts through sincerely taking shelter of the association of devotees, hearing the Lord's glories, and chanting the holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes, Kirtan. <laughs> Nama Om Vishnu Pataya. Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinami Namaste Saraswati Deve Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Pasyatyade Sathari Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Adhita Gadadha Sri Vasati Gaur Bhakta 
हरी कृष्णा हरी कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरी 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 राम हरी राम 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 हरी हरी हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Hare Krishna, Hare 
Krishna, 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 Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Patitanam Pavani Bio Vaishnave Bio Namo Namo. Thank you very much. On behalf of Sri Sri Radha Ras Bihari Mandir, is Kanjugu Mumbai. We express our heartfelt gratitude to His Holiness Radhanath Swami Maharaj for taking us through the entire Ramayana and this ecstatic Kirtan. We thank Him by chanting the holy names. Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! 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 Hare Hare! Hare Rama! Hare Rama! Rama Rama! Hare Hare! 
इस ओर राधनाथ स्वामी महाराज की इस ओर श्रीराज स्वामी महाराज की थोड़ा जगह दीजिए अरे बोल All devotees, please take prasadam. Prasadam is being served. After prasadam, the exit sign is there. The wa hand wash also is there. Please leave your plates and wash your hands there and exit from this side only. Hare Krishna. We also thank all the devotees who have come to participate in this program. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. There is a book stall of books written by His Holiness Giriraj Swami Maharaj. So those who would like to get the books, you can get also. There is a book, book table.